first judge I'd like to introduce um, is Judge John Michael Gidry, who you just heard from. Judge Gidry has been a member of the Louisiana First Circuit Court of Appeals since 1997. Prior to that, he served five years as a member of the Louisiana State Senate and served a year prior to that as a member of the Louisiana's House of Representatives. So he's been in public service here for over 30 years. Judge Gidry is a former assistant parish attorney for the city of East Baton Rouge and the parish of East Baton Rouge. He's a former assistant clerk of the Louisiana House of Representatives. John Gidry, Judge John Gidry, is a past president of the Board of Directors of the Louisiana Judicial College. Judge Gidry is an adjunct professor at the Southern University Law Center and a past adjunct professor at the Nelson Mandela School of Public Policy at Southern University in Baton Rouge. Judge Gidry is a frequent CLE lecturer. Judge Gidry is also a member of several professional organizations, including the American and National Bar Associations, the American Judges Association, the Louisiana Bar Association, the Louisiana Judicial Council of the National Bar Association, the Baton Rouge Bar Association, and the Louis A. Martinet Legal Society. He's also a member of the Baton Rouge Bar Association Pro Bono Committee and the Domestic Violence Curriculum Development Advisory <coughs> Committee. He received his Bachelor's of Art in Political Science from Louisiana State University and his Juris Doctorate from the Southern University Law Center. We are grateful to have Judge John Michael Gidry. Section B of the New Orleans 
Orleans Parish Criminal Court. In 2014, he left New Orleans but remained in prosecution by joining the East Baton Rouge District Attorney's Office. He was the section chief of Section 7 of the 19th JPC in the East Baton Rouge District Attorney's Office. He continued to uh, serve his community in other ways by facilitating the Real Talk program, a program designed to bring community stakeholders along with law enforcement um, and attorneys together. He, um, in local and high school, middle school settings. He's also started um, a program which started in Florida following the um, Trayvon Martin shooting. He aided in the facilitation of nationwide roll of the program at McKinley High School. So Will has worked in the schools. He's also done some work after the 2016 shooting death of uh, Alton Sterling, and uh, he, uh, he worked on that case. So Will has done a lot of the work in the community. Um, I, I don't know, Will, if you know your website doesn't say the year you... Uh, uh, 2020, 2020, when I got elected. But I was going to say, please don't read all that. <laughs> <laughs> he was elected to uh, the 19th JDC in 2020. And yes, you can see he has a variety of experience. And there's some um, game-changing things that he started with domestic violence as well. Next we have uh, Judge Smith. So Judge Smith is a native of Baton Rouge. He graduated in 98 from Scotlandville Magnet High School. In 91, he received his BS in economics from Southern University, and he briefly worked in the banking industry in Dallas, Texas. Upon returning to Baton Rouge, he attended Southern University Law Center. While there, he was an executive editor of Southern University's Law Review and a member of the Moot Court Board. After receiving his Juris Doctorate in 1995, Judge Smith began his legal career as a prosecutor with the District Attorney's Office and continued his career as a prosecutor with the Attorney General's Office. During that time, he also maintained a private practice in the area of civil law, which later include personal injury and criminal defense and probate law. In March of 2004, he was appointed to the District, district Board to fill a vacancy which in East Baton Rouge School Board. He was elected to fill the seat in September of 2004 and re-elected in 07 and 2010 and 2014. He also served as a vice president of the school board from 2010 to 2014. He also was a public defender for the city of Baker from 2012 to 2015. Judge Smith first ascended to the bench in November of 2015 after winning in October 2015 election for at-large division C at Baton Rouge City Court. In October of 2019, he was elected to fill division A seat of the 19th JDC. That's where he presides over criminal section five. Um, and next we have the honorable Judge Carpassus. He was born in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and he graduated from Redemption, 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 Redemption High School in 1982 and continued his studies at Louisiana State University, where he received his Bachelor of Science degree in 1986. Judge Carpassus attended law school at LSU's Paul M. Herbert Law Center, earning his Juris Doctor's degree in 1992. He ascended the bench of the 19th JDC in May of 2018. He has a criminal docket prior to taking the bench. He maintained a private practice over 25 years. He was the president of the Baton Rouge Bar Association in 2010 after serving on its board for nine years. He was the chairman of the Young Lawyers Section in 1997 after serving on its executive council. He is in 2004 recipient of the Louisiana State Bar Association Pro Bono Public Award. He is married to Lauren Dutcher Carpassus, and they have three children. Okay, last but not least, we have the Honorable Judge Donald R. Johnson, Chief Judge um, in Division B, Section 24. 
So uh, Judge Donald R. Johnson is a lifelong resident of Baton Rouge. In 1977, he graduated from Southern University with a BS in Mechanical Engineering. In 1982, he earned his Juris Doctor degree from Louisiana State University. And immediately after graduation, he worked as an assistant DA with the East Baton Rouge Parish District Attorney's Office. During this period, he opened a private law office until his election to the City Court of Baton Rouge in 1993. In 1999, he was elected to the 19th JDC, where he has served on all divisions of court. Currently, he serves on criminal traffic, drug treatment, and free trial release court. And he's currently running to serve on the Court of Appeals, First Circuit Court of Appeals. So, Judge Johnson holds a firm conviction that education is the key to his success. In addition to his law degrees, he has con uh, continued in pursuit of higher education with many degrees from uh, several prestigious universities around the country. He's also, uh, Judge Johnson's bio is like three pages, y'all. He, <laughs> he is more than qualified, but we're going to reserve uh, a little time so that we can get to why we are here to ask questions of the judges and have a, a question and answer section, uh, session. Judges, I would like to um, invite anybody who's an advocate or resource in the com community who provides services to either victims or perpetrators, um, and I, for lack of a better word, would you please introduce yourself so we can just know what who our audience is. And I know Tawana left out. Um, she's with the Butterfly Society. She's the founder of the, uh, the Butterfly Society. She comes check it out. I provide domestic abuse intervention program for defendants. Um, currently, I hold those classes at Baton Rouge City Court in person. I also have an online class for first-time offenders. Um, that is a six-week program in which they must take the class one day a week. I'm sorry, once a week. They cannot take more than one class a week. Um, so that's who I am. Oh, I've been doing this since 2008. Good evening, everyone. I'm Tawana Harris, founder and executive director of the Butterfly Society, a nonprofit domestic violence organization here in the city of Baton Rouge. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Campbell. I'm a past facilitator for Baton Rouge City Court, Domestic Violence Court. I am also a member of the District Attorney's Stamford Law uh, Committee. Uh, we deal in domestic violence as well, and also have my own private practice in domestic violence as well. Okay, so we're ready to start. And I must say, the Southern University Law Clinic and the Butterfly Society um, work together to put this together tonight, and I don't know if I introduced myself, but I'm Marsha Burden, and I uh, manage the domestic violence law clinic at Southern University Law Okay. Okay. Uh, Captain Dave Mays, Baton Rouge City Police, uh, investigative support commander, uh, oversee forensics, live in Hayden Prince, Family Justice Center, uh, high tech. Uh, former homicide, armed robbery, murdering, free narcotic task force. Uh, I work in all those divisions. Uh, I'm a proud alumnus of Southern University. So uh, I'm glad to be here. Good evening, everyone. Leslie Ricard Chambers, Assistant Chief Administrative Officer to Mayor Broom. Uh, 
prior prosecutor, prior deputy executive counsel, and policy advisor to Governor Edwards. provided some questions to ask and I'm gonna ask and you are um, and I'll start with Judge John Michael Gentry. What is the biggest challenge you face as a judge when making decisions? Well that may not be for you because you're no longer making decisions. Well you do make decisions in the Court of Appeal on um, domestic violence cases. So I'll ask that to all of the panelists. The biggest challenge you have you face as a judge when making those decisions. Well, from the appellate, uh, I'm sorry, I don't think this mic is working. Uh, yes, push. Push the power on the bottom. Uh, push the power on the bottom. See the top. Okay, I'll turn it over. Uh, and it should be green. I turn it. Push it again. That's green. So it's yeah. interesting. That's district court judges there. Oh, okay. <laughs> that technology. Okay. Uh, so. The biggest, from the appellate standpoint, the biggest thing that, that uh, we face is making sure that everything that needs to be on the record is on the record. The Court of Appeal um, is a court of record, and if it doesn't appear on the record, it doesn't exist. So it's important for the lawyers that are representing um, either the perpetrator or the victim in a domestic violence case to make sure they get whatever they need to get in terms of facts, uh, documents, testimony, and the record, and in terms of the judges when they ultimately make their ruling, certainly it's helpful to us to have written reasons to uh, let us know the basis for the rulings they made. So we are, as an appellate court, depending on the record uh, that is made by the um, uh, individuals at the trial court level, and to the extent that something is argued in the appellate briefs, but it's not evident in the record, we really can't act on it. So that's the biggest challenge that we face is because we have lawyers come in oral argument and in their briefs they're arguing about things that we can't verify in the record. They failed to ask the question to the witness. They failed to get the document in. They failed to have a ruling placed on the record so there is no minute entry or any transcript to verify what they're saying, and, and that's problematic. Now, um, and in some instances, we will get a procurium from the trial court that um, attempts to give us additional information, but beyond that, it's, it's difficult for us to um, address some of the issues raised in the appeal when it's not I think I challenge the most at the trial court level is at the initial stage of the case, at the arrest stage, and identifying what kind of case we have in front of us. And for me, I kind of look at the cases as two possible differences. One is circumstantial. You know, uh, circumstances have been created, arise, that cause things to happen. You know, whether it's stress from work, whether it's drug-related stress, whether it's you know, someone cheating on the other person, something triggers the event, and it's based on the circumstances. That's most of it, by the way. And then you have the other, where it's a definite controlling behavior, dominating behavior, someone trying to assert their dominance over the other party, which is the more serious. And identification of the case is one of those two I think is the first priority, and then what steps are appropriate, you know, to put in safeguards going forward. And they're critical decisions. So that, to me, that's the, the initial part of this case is the most challenging part. I'll piggyback on that. Okay. Just kidding. I'll agree with Judge Fassett, but at the end of the day, when we sit, when we're sitting up there, deciphering facts, what really happened? A lot of domestic violence, he said, she said. She says something, he says something, assuming he is the uh, defendant, she's the victim. And it, I've seen it the other way. The man is the victim, the female is the aggressor. Deciphering who's telling the truth. And sometimes, um, it's one-on-one -on -one in the civil hearings as far as I'm for, when they file for a protective order. He 
says one thing, she says one thing. Well, this didn't happen, and then there's always arguments going back and forth between the two court. The safest thing I do, if I feel there's some merit to it, I will issue a simple restraining orders and set them for a six month period for review, where they can't be in contact. Um, a lot of it arises out of family court. I'll give deference to the family court if it's an order dealing with children, visitation, whatnot, but I normally set a six month review. So to answer the question, it's deciphering what's fact, what's made up. And the facts are supported by the evidence. The officer has a report, says he saw bruises on the victim, scratches, whatever the case may be, broken things in the house, that goes to the weight of the person requesting the protective order. The DA would then, would, uh, on the criminal side, would prosecute, so they're going to call the witnesses, and it becomes a credibility issue. Thank you. Yes. From the perspective where I sit on the 19th Judicial District Court, my decision making is more in, in line with where are we going to model our conduct prospectively? And, and by that I mean this. Are our courts designed to achieve the outcomes that we want? Are our courts and, 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 and their sentencing and their adjudication of the discipline of the conduct, are we equipped with the resources and the type of evidence-based models that work? So, so the decisions that I make are more in, in line with reimagining the court system, reimagining the whole way we do business. And I say that because the conduct is post-adjudication. Uh, uh, we adjudicate on the facts that Ms. Tarver said, but then what do we do with that? What do we do with the facts after that? What do we do with the defense? Well, we've got to be smart at that. We've got to uh, create institutions and appropriate funding to resolve the conflict. We can punish people. We can do that easily. What we're not doing an effective job at is creating success, creating a success from that violation of the law. So we've got to spend a lot of time now making decisions that are going to stop the conduct and that are going to propose solutions so that the family, if they're going to stay together, we've got to help them cease the conduct. If not, they make sure they go their separate ways. Here's the idea that I have. If you did not have a successful marriage, then turn it, let's have a successful divorce. <laughs> if you did not have a successful relationship, have a successful separation and give you the tools to do it. So I'm imagining, and we, we just announced this today, we're going to have this domestic violence court, an intervention court. What is that? We're going to assess the risk of reoffending. And for those defendants who are guilty, we're going to process them with certain accountability standards, certain accountability standards. So my decision is from that perspective. Administrate a court and setting a visionary direction of where are we going with our mother, where are we going with our families, where are we going with our children, making these decisions that are so disruptive to uh, our normal way of doing, doing things. So, so that's, that's my perspective on decision making, administrative wise, setting up direction for the future. So make sure I understand it's the most difficult part of those those decision making processes, I guess, when we deal with domestic cases. So, and, 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 and everything that uh, the Chief said, I agree with, especially the back end, you know, talk with Fred, you know, Judge John Michael. The, the, the thing that I want to narrow in on or focus in on, though, is, is probably from how I'm dealing with it, we have, obviously, I both the civil and I do the criminal. Uh, since people saying they can't get real back. The civil and the criminal uh, protective orders. The, I, what I find the most challenging, though, is when they come in that original arrest, person was accused of committing the infraction. It's now taking or trying to make a determination looking at the bare bones. Sometimes you don't get all the information. Sometimes you get half of the information and you're not necessarily seeing the full story and you're not supposed to at that point in time. But yet and still, 
taking domestic violence, the accusation as serious as you must, right? Now putting everyone in a place where, look, everybody is safe, emotional, real passionate individuals here. We have individuals that are being accused of crimes, that are adamant about saying, I didn't do anything. This did not happen. I know that that exists, that there are people out there that will fabricate stories. Conversely, we have those individuals that are, that are really, really, truly accused of doing some heinous activity out here. And oftentimes what I find, because passion is such that it's so hard to keep those individuals away from each other, as, as, as Judge Smith even said, Mike, to keep those individuals away from each other and understanding that, look, if you've got somebody that's lying on you, when we say stay away just for this time period, this could be in the best interest. We don't want you to be in a situation where somebody is continuing to lie on you and put you in a situation where you have the potential to lose your freedom. And conversely, the same thing. Why do we want to put you in harm's way? So I find it more difficult than anything, just as the standpoint of communication is concerned, right? Being able to successfully communicate and get that point across to those individuals, and that's what the battery is about to die. To get that point across. Thank you. To get that point across to those individuals to understand that this may be in the best. There is a balancing test that we as judges have to consider victims, victims' rights, the protection of victims, and also the defendant and our accused party. When the matters initially come to us, it's typically after a person is initially arrested. When I read the reports, I look to determine the aggravated nature of the offense alleged whether or not there's the presence of laceration, whether there are blood, visible bruising, strangulation being involved, and whether or not there is the presence of minor children. Um, it's my appreciation and my belief that while although we can protect an individual um, victim or seek to protect an individual victim, that a lot of these crimes become generational, you know, um, it may have stemmed from other past incidents. So for that matter, I am pro rehabilitation. When I read the affidavits of probable cause as they come in, I make it um, a bond condition for them to do certain things to mitigate the behavior because what I seek to do is to educate and stop the behavior because if not, what we will do is, while although two people can very well part and go separate ways, but that won't stop the behavior from going on into the next relationship. So we have to stop the cycle. Um, I look at each case, again, on a case-by-case -case basis, and um, overall, I feel that my objective is to make sure that we keep the public safe and that also we seek to utilize the resources that we have available through the court system so that we can get defendants access to the resources or the help that they need to stop the behavior. I 
How you doing? My name is Kyle Luciano. Uh, I want to ask, why do some people get less than 26 weeks of a class if the law says 26? Like most people get 17 instead of 26. Let me just say this. We, we assess the number of weeks based upon the degree of the violation or the repeat violation. So we administer justice uniquely for you if you're committing that offense. So it's not a standardized approach. It's based upon the risk and the undertaking to change the risk. So we're trying to use a measured approach to solve the uh, Ms. Burden, and I would like to piggyback on that. Um, a lot of times, too, what you can look at is whether or not a person has available resources to them, whether or not they have um, difficulty with conflict resolution or if they lack coping skills. And so, in essence, that's what we seek to do, to empower them um, to gain those skills that they may be lacking. And then, of course, you look at the, um, the level and degree of the aggravation of the offense. You know, a push would definitely be um, something a lower tier than a person being knocked unconscious, right? And with that, would it also be fair to say when you said bonds, you also look at the risk assessment and there's a variation in the bonds because of the aggravated nature of the offense, as you indicated? We have a duty to protect the public also. While all of those persons who are arrested are constitutionally entitled to a bond absent certain um, crimes of violence, um, we have to also do a risk assessment to determine whether or not we can potentially put the public at harm or, or danger, risk of harm or danger. Hey, I got done. My name is Tyrell Jakes. Um, I just wanted to know um, if somebody arrested for domestic violence, how y'all distinguish like who can go to domestic violence class and who go to anger management? Because y'all give some people anger management, y'all give some people the DVOC class. Judge Smith. Uh, I can talk about That's a very good and interesting question. Normally, if someone is found guilty or pleads to a domestic violence um, charge, uh, domestic abuse battery, uh, violation of a protective order, and I'm only speaking for myself, I will then send someone to a DVOC class, domestic violence class. If there are factors that come into play and the person pleads down or they, they plead to simple battery or simple assault and it was somewhat not a major issue or the, there's evidentiary issues, then I would probably say, okay, anger management. That's just me. I don't know what my other colleagues would do, but sometimes it depends on the severity of what the person pleads to or is found guilty of. It, yeah, if I may. So again, as Judge Smith indicated, it's, it's really per, per judge, you know. And, and I can give you some guidelines, but I can tell you the same thing like Judge Fox or Robert says, and Judge, Judge Don John says, every case is different. They're all unique, it's case by case basis. I can tell you right now, generally if I'm gonna do DVOP though, it's a domestic in nature relationship. Look, there are some cases that can come in as an aggravated battery. There's some cases that can come in as a second degree battery. Notice one word I didn't say in either one of those is domestic abuse, right? But if I see that there is an underlying issue there, then absolutely I can go ahead on and I can say, all right, DVOP. If I look at a person's history, right? The rap sheet, but that's something else that we actually get a hold of. And I can see so many different domestic arrests, right? <laughs> Not saying that anybody's ever been convicted, but then we can just ask the question, have you ever taken a DVOP program? Have you ever done any of these uh, types of programs before? Well, I can see that there may be a need here to assess certain things to begin some mitigation with the actual case. Not saying somebody's guilty or not, but let's, let's see if we can help make the betterment of people, right? 
Uh, when you talk about anger management, again, I'm looking at it the other way. There's nothing domestic in this at all, but I look and I see that there's a history of somebody that just flashes out. And we can't keep doing that in society because that causes problems for everybody, right? So we may need to go ahead and that may be a different road that we have to take. But again, what it comes down to is just like pretty much all the other judges have said when it, when it relates to this, case by case basis, looking at what could potentially be necessary and what could be specifically needed in each individual case. Um, the other question was why are parent-child related incidences referred to the domestic abuse intervention program for 17 or 26 weeks? Well, because the domestic relationship exists between the parties. So the, in order for it to fall within that category, just like the gentleman just asked the question about an anger management versus a domestic violence offender type program, you have to look at the, the relationship that the relationships that exist between the party. Um, there is not a there is nothing that's set in stone that says it has to be 17 weeks or 26 weeks that would be specific to the judge based off of the allegations or the circumstances surrounding that individual event, um, circumstance or, or incident. Did, am I understanding your question correctly? I see that you are shaking your head. Yeah, I'm sorry. The question was based off of it's a parent-child relationship. Right. Which is defined under the law. However, they're referred to the domestic abuse intervention program, which is for people that are in relationships. Oh. So the question is, is there something else for a different program that's more appropriate for them to be referred to? Because typically I send them back because that's not a relational Okay, I understand what, you, what you're asking now. When cases come before the court and the district attorney, we have some prior DAs in here. When they look at what, how, when they define a domestic relationship, it's the family relationship. So when it comes before the court, since a person has been accused of committing a domestic violence related type um, crime, then that's probably how they end up um, as a, with the referral to one of the, those type programs based off of the, the, the actual crime itself. You know, so let's just say hypothetically, if a person is um, built with domestic abuse battery, you know, what they're looking at is the fact that there's a domestic relationship that exists between the parties and you have people who possibly live under the same roof. They have issues with conflict resolution. And so they refer them to a program in order for them to get some type of treatment for their underlying issues. However, with the referral, that's not with the judges having insight as to everything that is taught in your course. So what we're looking at is, okay, we have an issue, we need to, to put them in touch with resources where they can um, adjust or gain some insight or assistance with coping and getting along within their domestic relationship, whether it be one of an intimate relationship or blood relationship. But we don't have insight as to what is actually taught in those respective courses. So if it's something that you as an instructor deems inappropriate, that's perhaps a conversation where you should you can maybe even come to one of the criminal judges meetings and you can discuss the topics that you teach within your respective course or within the domestic violence offender programs and that way we can better tailor it to meet the individual needs of the people who appear before our courts okay I have a couple of questions from a victim. They want to know what happens if a victim does not have pictures or any type of documentation to prove the abuse, and uh, can the case still move forward? And if the victim decides not to testify or even reconciles or recant, so anyone can uh, can speak to that, just Unfortunately, that's an everyday occurrence that, and I saw this when I was a prosecutor and a defense attorney and now a judge. I just wanted him out the house. 
I called the police so they could get him out the house and he could cool off. As far as pictures, you're not going to, oh, he hit me, let me take a picture. Some people do that. But I say that to say, if it is a problem, you have to come to court and address it. If, you, if you're in love with this person and you think he just had a bad day, something's going on at work and he took it out on you, this is what Judge Johnson is talking about with domestic violence court. It's not you're going to keep coming to court. We're going to make sure that you all will go to programs to address those needs. So the, the, what we in the legal community, and I'm speaking for the DA, he, when someone files the charges or calls the police, and the next thing, a day later, they're up there filing a drop charge. That happens all the time. I saw it all the time as a DA. Um, so my advice to any victim is to pursue it because once it's dropped, Unfortunately, it's probably going to happen again and again. And what keeps me up at night is not the bond stuff that you saw on TV. It's that did I do a protective order for somebody that may end up dead? That's what keeps me up at night. So my advice is to pursue these matters, no matter how minor you think it is, because it's gonna happen, I, I'm assuming, and history shows you right, and Tawana and Karen can tell you, it happens over and over again. You give the offender some power when you are dropping those charges. And if you think of it, take the pictures. We got cell phones, I thought it was stupid to put cameras on phones, but oh well, we got them, so let's, you know. Fred, can, can I jump in on this one? And, and the only reason why I wanted to jump in, and then I'll pass it to you, Judge uh, Profasi, as the most recent former prosecutor out of this esteemed group up here, I, 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 to answer that question, yes, there is something called evidence-based prosecution, right? I've had the occasion in the past where I was able to actually prosecute a case where the victim didn't even show up. Strictly evidence-based prosecution. Now, a long time ago, a lifetime ago. Those are extremely difficult cases. I need to make sure that you all and everyone in this room also understands that anyone else seeing this as well. Testimony is evidence. We, we don't understand, sometimes we, we fail to understand that testimonial evidence is another piece of evidence just as well as this water bottle that's standing and that I'm holding in my hand here, right? So just because you don't have photographs, just because there wasn't active bruising that the officer could say that he saw when he arrived on the scene, well, we also know that maybe you may have been a darker skin tone. Maybe the bruising, and as we find out through, through testimony and understanding of when, when experts come in and talk about this, sometimes the bruising takes time to actually appear, right? Those capillaries, those blood capillaries that are bursting. I'm talking to my nurse, hopefully my nurse judge doesn't actually say I'm wrong. But these are things that actually occur. So it's not, it's not the end of the world. When you talk about a recanted statement, again, does that make it more difficult to prosecute? Yes. But that goes to the weight, not the admissibility, right? This is just another statement that the trier of fact would have to be able to consider when it comes time to proving the allegation. So I just wanted to actually put those things out there just to give that answer. Again, as more recently, I know I actually had to be dealing with those those situations and trying those situations. But Judge Profasi, now I know Judge Fox. Yeah, I was also going to say, the question came from a victim's standpoint. You know, had questions as a victim, you probably are scared, you probably aren't familiar with what's going to happen. The DA's office has victim advocates, and I would say before a victim makes any decision, they should consult with these advocates because they can provide resources to them, they can provide support to them, they can provide separate residence for them, they can do a lot for them that they may not even know before they decide 
well, no one's going to believe me. I'm going to go drop charges or something like that. Get the consultation, get the help and support, and it may open some windows for them. So. I would just like to add that, first of all, with domestic violence, you know, history shows that it's a form of power, you know, power exhibited over a person's mind and um, ultimately over a person's body. You know, there are people who may be in necessity circumstances whereby they may be reliant upon that person for support, support of themselves, support of their children, and if, a, if there are people on the outside who have never walked in those shoes, they may not necessarily understand the actions of the victim, especially those victims who recant their stories, those victims who show up and they want to file drop charge affidavits. However, the district attorney makes the decision as to prosecution. They are the sole prosecutorial authority. While although they may consider what a victim wants, they are not, um, they don't necessarily have to be reliant upon that. They can make independent decisions to prosecute anyway, you know, especially if they look at the severity of the circumstances, the history of the offender. And what we can do is, you know, we have measures that we can employ as judges where we're not just restricted to orders of protection from abuse because as everyone knows it's, it's a piece of paper you know there have been people who have had active protective orders who have who who have ultimately had their their life taken away because it's a piece of paper but what we can do is we can you know put we can have them supervised while they're on bond we can track them through gps tracking device systems whereby they have blackout zones where we're notified or the appropriate officials are notified if they get close to the victims. And so these are things that we as judges can do to ensure the protection and safety of the victims. And then of course also with the victim, um, the victim advocates through the, through the district attorney's office, they also put them in touch with resources, whether it be for housing, food, child care, things that can help them out to sustain their lives on a daily basis. to go in a certain direction, 
We can use all the tools that we have, and it's not going to work. So uh, we need to identify and understand the science, the discipline of being involved in domestic violence. Here, here's what I'm suggesting. What, what am I saying about this? We wear black robes, but we're becoming more and more involved in understanding what white robes do, what white robes do. So we're, we're developing models, we're studying the application of law, and we're acquiring skill sets that are way beyond the application of just going to law school and getting a law degree. So we're enhancing our skill set so that when you come to us, we'll be prepared to make decisions to sanction the defendant and make positive decisions for the victim if the victim is going back. So that's, that's my, I want to know what the victim wants and I want to make it easy. Well, um, certainly if you see something, say something. The statistics are really clear that in all of these um, victimizations, there are family members, there are friends, there are coworkers who see the signs and who see what's going on and your failure to say something and then when something happens to say, oh, if I would have said something. Well, in, unfortunately, in many instances, it's too late. And so again, um, and just like you have crime stoppers and you have other uh, methods of anonymously saying something, however it takes, if you don't feel comfortable saying it openly, then do it anonymously. You know, if you know somebody's being victimized, you know, let somebody know so they can go in and do a welfare check. They can go in and check on the children, having um, the Department of Social Services go in and check on, on kids that you think are being, um, being the victims of domestic violence or, or the adults as well. So, but again, I think we have an obligation as members of the community, as family members, as church members, as coworkers, if we see something that we ought to say something. Now, I realize one of the um, methods that the abuser uses is trying to isolate the individual from friends, from family members, uh, so that you don't see something and that they don't communicate with you, but that should be a sign to you as well that that person is isolating your family member, isolating your friend, exercising that power for the purpose that you cannot witness and, and be able to assist them. But one of the things that uh, Chief Judge Johnson talked about that I think is really important is that in order for judges to be effective, they have to be trained and educated with respect to domestic violence. Um, I'm a member of the LPOR um, faculty um, that trains and educate judges around the state with respect to domestic violence, as well as other community partners, district attorneys, law enforcement, et cetera. But it's a voluntary uh, situation right now that um, judges, just like lawyers, have to get a certain amount of CLE um, uh, credit, but it's not required that a part of that credit be domestic violence. We require in the uh, judicial college, uh, the Supreme Court has said that five of your hours as a judge has to come from the judicial college, but it doesn't designate the programs within the judicial college that deal with domestic violence. There are domestic violence programs put on uh, by LPOR, which is a protective order registry within the judicial college for judges to learn, but if judges don't voluntarily take those uh, classes. So there is a uh, House Concurrent Resolution 70 that passed in the legislature that requests uh, the Louisiana Supreme Court to require a minimum of four hours of continuing legal education on the topic of domestic violence to be completed by district court, family court, juvenile uh, court judges, district attorneys, and assistant district attorneys as well. Uh, the reason why it's a request resolution is because of separation of powers. It is the judiciary, the Supreme Court ultimately, that determines the um, what judges and lawyers have to do and are in the position to make them do things in lieu of discipline. And so the legislature recognizing that separation of powers has requested, rather than legislating themselves, they have requested that uh, just like the Supreme Court makes you take ethics, just like the Supreme Court makes you take, take professionalism, that they make you take domestic violence. And some of the uh, aspects of, of that course would be the dynamics of domestic violence, the neurobiology of trauma and its implications for victims and witness communication, strangulation, uh, which is one of the key lethality indicators. So when you have somebody coming into your court and they say they've been strangled, that is a lethality indicator. You ought to very well take that seriously. So that's one of the things that this course will emphasize 
to judges to be looking uh, for uh, again to the extent that the orders are even signed but they're not transmitted to the registry so that when a police officer calls in or checks the registry and they, they can't find that that person has a protective officer it inhibits their ability to do their job so uh, s simply making sure that judges transmit their protective orders uh, to the statewide uh, registry domestic abuse intervention programming standards and legal requirements what you all were just talking about making sure that judges are aware of what are the um, types of uh, programs out there and so that they can best uh, uh, suit an individual to a particular um, type of program. If you don't know what the resources are out there, then it's hard for you to send a person uh, to those resources. Um, again, to be aware of the available support services for the victims in the community so that, as, as was just pointed out, one of the reasons why people drop charges and the reasons why people go back is because they don't have the necessary resources to house themselves and their children to pay their bills to do the types of things because in many instances the abuser is the breadwinner and so to the extent that you wonder why a person might go back because their kids are starving because they can't buy clothes for the children because they don't have anywhere else to stay and maybe family members will let you come and stay two or three nights or maybe a week but how long is that going to go on so it is important to identify and judges be aware of the resources that they can um, uh, direct individuals to applicable state and federal domestic violence laws, particularly the laws with regard to firearms, so that when individuals are come before the court, what can the court do about getting those firearms away from those individuals? There's state and federal laws uh, with respect to the implications of domestic violence and the ability to possess uh, a, a weapon. Uh, and then uh, beginning in January 1st, 2023, this would seek to be applied to the district attorney and assistant district attorneys because, um, as, as was pointed out, they have the prosecutorial decision making. And so they need to be specifically educated with respect uh, to, mes to domestic violence as well. Um, so again, these are the types of uh, um, things that would be taught during that mandatory annual four hours of domestic violence education, each and every judge that is going to have somebody come before them with regard to domestic violence ought to have specific mandated uh, education in the area of domestic violence. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and I know our time is up and I really appreciate it, but I wanna give each judge the opportunity if they wanna say something in closing to share with you whatever it is that they want to say. And I want to thank everybody again for coming out. And if you didn't get your question addressed, please submit it to me and I'll try to see if I can get one of the judges to answer. I'd like to go first, uh, just because I'm the oldest one up here. So. <laughs> uh, let's look toward the future. But, but when I say look toward the future, here's what I want you to think about. When a domestic issue occurs, one of the parties involved is arrested. So if someone goes to jail, then you got someone coming in, the victim usually for protective order, and then you got family, children issues. And and what's happening? This person has to go to multiple courts to get all of their circumstances resolved. They've got to go to criminal court. They've got to go to family court. They may have to go to civil court. We need an integrated approach to this conduct. What did I say we integrated? One stop shop. Where the one judge will handle all this business. The criminal court business, the family court business, and the domestic violence protective order business. Rather than sending you up to this floor, that floor, and that court. We've got to think about how we're going to take our subject matter jurisdiction that's diverse, that's separate, and bring it under one umbrella. So that one judge will have power over the whole, uh, uh, the perpetrator and the victim and the family. I think that's the model that I'm going to suggest. And that's where I'm going to start. Professor Bird, I just appreciate you having this gathering and bringing attention to this issue. It's very, very important. Probably if you ask the judges here on any given week that you're on duty and you're setting bonds for people who are arrested during the week, probably 25% to 30% domestic related. It's a huge segment of the problem. 
And so just bringing light to it, having the discussion, getting people more familiar and educated is a great favor. So thank you for having the meeting. Just a quick couple of things. Number one is that we have to be very careful how we handle people who come in front of us. People have been traumatized and we need to make sure that we recognize that and we need to make sure that we don't put people back in that situation. If you send a person to couples counseling, you're putting that person back in that situation. If you take the victim and send the victim to anger management, then you're re-victimizing the victim. Um, you don't wanna just send both of them there because then the other thing is to remember the children. Uh, first of all, the uh, children who uh, are witnesses of abuse are uh, having more of a likelihood to be abused or to become abusers. And so we need to be very careful in terms of the custody decisions that are made, uh, supervised visitation, making sure that there's safe exchanges that occur, and making sure that there's adequate child support. You don't want the person to go back to the, uh, the perpetrator, make sure that you in the family court make that person pay the child support so they are less um, uh, reliant on that uh, person. And again, um, we, we just have to make sure that we recognize that in addition to that perpetrator, and uh, adult perpetrator and adult victim in many instances, uh, we need to pay attention to the children. And first, first, Professor Burton, uh, thank you for the invite. Thank you. I know uh, this program was on last year. We had to do it by Zoom. Uh, so I, I'm so grateful uh, that, that if nothing else, we're able to finally uh, meet again in person and really be able to press the flesh as they shake, shake some hands, really get to put faces and names to everything that, that we're doing. So I think it's so very important, as the other judges have echoed earlier. My, my, my last comment, so um, I'm troubled and I'm terrified all at the same time by one thing that I see on the bench. And that is some of these offenders are so young. And that was a comment that was, I believe, that was mentioned by a few different judges up here, but it's just seeing so many young folks that are coming in that this toxicity Right, that's the phrase that this toxic love, right? That they're learning that this is what love is. If he doesn't hit me, or if she doesn't fight me, or if she doesn't poke me in my face, if she doesn't do this, or if he doesn't do that, then there is no love there. These learned behaviors, right? And I'm gonna be honest with you, while we are sitting here having these open conversations, this open dialogue, understanding and seeing how this is an issue, what I've truly learned in just my limited time on the bench, my limited time on the bench, is that there are some segments that this is absolutely normal, right? And I don't want to offend, but I say this with my, with my colleague and a mentor of mine, Judge Don Johnson on the end, when I think back to the, and he can, he can agree or disagree with me on this one, I don't know. When I think back to the Civil Rights Movement, the, the movement of non-violent interactions, right? How was that actually able to be as successful as it was? One of the things that I consider and think about all the time, because when you think about it, there was an element that is present there. It's shame, not from those individuals that are being beaten and battered and abused, but it's when those cameras turn on those individuals that are doing this horrible activity, that are beating individuals who are being nonviolent, who are just sitting at a food counter, when they're beating those individuals who are just peacefully marching, protesting. And when you see the, the heinous acts of those individuals, when the camera and the spotlight is on those individuals, that shame from those individuals who are apathetic, who are not acting, who have just stood by and watched it, but now all of a sudden, oh my goodness, this is what we were allowing? This is what's actually taking place? I often have to wonder, is this what is necessary to put that spotlight, right? To put that spotlight on this domestic abuse problem that we're having, especially with our young people, who again, may not have any other understanding, may not have any other idea, because again, they're lambasted with what a toxic relationship looks like. VH1 got this show, Love and Hip Hop got that, flipping over tables, beating each other up, pushing everybody, showing my age, Krishan uh, 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 rocking Blueface. Right? These people are getting their teeth knocked out 
and these young people are just seeing this and they're saying, well, this is what love is. And I think that if we can actually just turn the spotlight on some of these things and really show this is not acceptable behavior, I think we may actually begin to finally see a change, maybe. One of the things that I tell people when they come to court, especially um, those involving domestic violence related matters, is love should not hurt. You know, love should make you feel good. Love should empower you. Love should uplift you. And I think that as a community, we need to think about domestic violence more than just in the month of October. This should be a daily conversation because it not only affects that individual family, it affects, the, it affects the entire community. We need not be judgmental. You know, there are often times people ask the question, why is the individual still there? How could you still be there? Why do you allow this person to treat you this way? Let's not be judgmental. Let's empower them and equip, with them, equip them with resources, you know, whether it be through domestic violence offender programs, anger management programs, um, some type of coping skills, parenting classes. You know, you never know what goes on behind closed doors and domestic relationships can be the most toxic because people live within close quarters. You know, they not only have to deal with the stressors of life, they have to come home and deal with stressors too. And then even when you factor into the equation, the current state of the economy, you know, people are struggling. They have a, a, a sense of hopelessness, and it oftentimes um, plays out into their relationships. And so, lastly, I would just say if you see something reported, you know, be a, be a support system to the people. You know, support them. You have people who are ashamed and people who are ashamed, both of them. It goes both directions from the person who was victimized and for the person who, um, who is the perpetrator. You know, oftentimes they're both ashamed. And so what we need to do is we need to educate them. And I'm glad that it was brought to my attention because I can tell you that I was not aware that the domestic violence offender program was strictly tiered towards parties who were involved in a relationship an intimate relationship because when we see domestic abuse battery or any type of domestic related matter we I'll tell you I'm gonna say we I I was under the impression that the programs were tailored to meet the individual's needs based off of the domestics relationship that existed between the parties and so now I know that we need to have a candid conversation with those providers amongst um, us as judges so that we can find out specifically what your programs entail and how it will or will not help the, these families and these individuals. Um, lastly, I'd like to thank you, Ms. Professor Burton, for putting on this function. Um, this is the second year in a row and I'd like to thank the Southern University Law Center um, Domestic Violence Clinic because they also provide resources to the community, especially for those who are disadvantaged, um, where they can get access to resources. And a lot of people don't know that these resources exist. And so ultimately, it's incumbent upon us, lastly, to be our brother's keeper. It, it warrants that sometimes. We have to do that. You know, not everyone is as strong as us. You know, so if you want to do good and get good in return, you know, extend yourself. Sometimes it'll put you in an uncomfortable situation, but you have to remember it's a bigger cause. Thank you. Thank you. I have two quick announcements. In the back, one of my students, Dion Sumer, and I will be presenting on Tuesday at the Goodwood Library on Domestic Violence 101. So if anybody wants to attend that, um, we will be talking and asking general questions about domestic violence. And I think, um, Ms. Harris, you have something where you're going into the schools yeah. during this month. So we go into the schools. Uh, Tawan and I work very closely together. Um, so when you talk about the young people, we try to reach them. Yeah. And so she'll be doing that on what day? Yeah, we're scheduled on the 27th. Week 
27th. On the 27th. On the 27th. But if there's anybody in here who needs some assistance, please see Tawana and myself afterwards and we can try to get you the resources or I can set you up with a consultation with me um, so that we can try to keep on addressing this problem in this community. And again, I thank you for coming out. Uh, Tawana, did I hear you say sorry to pastors?